started, so we have enough time for questions. Um, thank you so much for coming. There's lots of new faces here today, which is always wonderful. Um, my name is Sarah Rip. I'm the Outreach Coordinator and uh, Undergrad Advisor for the Latin American Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program. And i um, glad you made it out on this chilly, uh, first sort of fallish day that we have um, this fall. And as you can see, there's some hot tea and coffee and snacks in the back, so um, help yourself. And if you have an opportunity, there is um, a clipboard back there in the corner. If you want to sign up for our listserv, um, we send out a weekly event calendar every Thursday, so you can be added to that. And I'll turn it over to Alberto Vargas, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, well, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, this semester, we're having a series uh, of invited guests that are new faculty on campus. So we're very happy that today uh, Victor Colger Carvalho accepted to come and give, give this, this talk. Um, Professor Colger Carvalho got his PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. And he's here in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. He specializes in 18th and 19th century Latin American literature. He's First book uh, is called La Experiencia de lo Nuevo, and he's going to talk about uh, Dandies and Rastaquah, a history of snobbery in Latin America. Looking forward to see the meaning of that word. So welcome. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to Lassis for the invitation. And thanks to you for being here. Um, yes, I. Uh, I will speak about both terms, the Gandhi. I don't know how to pronounce the, the other one either, the Arasta Uh But um, I will also, uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, bring up a new dimension that wasn't here when I provided you with the title. So basically, um, what I want to share with you today is a project that has roots in earlier research um, on the emergence of, of uh, fashion in early 19th century Latin America. Fashion understood as a social mechanism. But now, um, um, this project is more related to my current interest in passing, um, in the problem of passing, racial passing, for example. Um, I am analyzing uh, the discourse of inauthenticity that was level um, against certain kinds of social performances in 18th and 19th century Latin America, uh, including that of the feminine man, the hombre mujer, uh, the snobbery of the pedantic man, the pedante, and the vanity of the, the fop, the petit maître. So linking the critiques uh, directed at these social types to those addressed towards uh, blacks and mulattoes um, I think might bring uh, to light uh, a broader construction of acceptable and unacceptable forms of mimesis. And while there is a large body of scholarship on um, passing in US studies, um, this is a relatively unexplored terrain in Latin American studies, and, uh, and one that has also, I think, compelling connections to, um, not only to race, but also to questions of gender and, and class. Uh, so I'll talk about passing more towards the end of the talk. Um, so let's talk about snobbery. Uh, this is a topic uh, you're all familiar with. Some people claim that we're all snobs up to a certain degree. For some of us, the snob is just a rare uh, specimen. But, uh, but we all seem to have an idea of what a snob is. Um, snobbish is nowadays usually understood as a synonym of a conceited, um, stuck up, right? And it's used to describe people who think they are better than they are better than than you, right? Or better than us. However, in its origins, um, the word snob meant precisely the opposite. Um, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, in the late 18th century, snob meant cobbler, and then came to refer to any ordinary person lacking high rank or status. And then, by the uh, 19th century, by the early 19th century, snob was being used to mean uh, a person with no breeding, both the honest laborers who knew their place and the vulgar social climbers who copied the manners of the upper classes. And finally, um, by the second half of the 19th century, the word shifted to its modern sense, um, a person who looks down on those regarded as uh, socially inferior. 
right? So, but I think it's worth um, noticing uh, that the early meaning is not totally lost. And think, for example, of um, Ama Isnav, this uh, famous um, text or talk given by Virginia Woolf in 1936, in which she, she pointed out the following. She says, the essence of snobbery is that you wish to impress other people. The snob is a, is a flutter-brained, hair-brained creature, so little satisfied with his or her own standing that in order to consolidate it, he or she is always flourishing a title or an honor in other people's faces, so that they may believe what he does not really believe, that he or she is somehow a person of importance. That is to say that um, Wolf relates the sense of superiority of the snob to a sense of inferiority, social inferiority more specifically, or what I will describe later as um, in terms of the category of uh, distinction. Now, the word snob or a snob only becomes relatively common in the Spanish language in the early 20th century, right? So why I'm interested in snobs if what I do is to think of 18th and 19th century uh, Latin America. Well, if you were to search for the words snob or esnovismo, snob, in all books in Spanish, digitized by Google, for example, you would only start finding uh, these words in texts published during the last few years of the 19th century. However, as it is, as it is always the case, I think, with, um, with Google, the fact that um, you don't get any results does not mean that there is nothing out there but that you don't know how to find it. At least that has been my experience in the last years. Uh, in this case, instead of searching for the words snob or snobismo, we should be looking for others. Let me mention just a few that I have found in the text. Um, and I mention them in Spanish because I don't know how to translate them really. Um, among the nouns, lechuguino, coqueta, fashionable, petimetre, currutaco, Leon, modista, paquete, catrín, fachenda, faceto, patarato, paramaya, cascarita, ciútico, huachafo, or among the verbs and expressions, pintar pajaritos, habilitar de cáscara, alucinar, pasar, pasen. Of course, each of these terms means something slightly different, and today I won't have time to refer to those differences, or to most of them. But let me just say that all of them can be approached critically through an inquiry into the nature of snobbery. What is more, the analysis of snobbery sheds light not only uh, on these particular social types, but also, and this is really why I'm interested in the problem of snobbery, it sheds light on uh, two of the most important debates in Latin American history, which are the debate on cultural importation, the relationship to Europe, for example, and the debate on democracy and social equality within Latin American nations. And if we have time, we can talk about this uh, later. <clears throat> OK. So to the, I, ha I have two bad news for you. Uh, my PowerPoint is very sad, so I'm not going to use it. And I know people nowadays like PowerPoint. The other bad news is that um, snobbery, I think, is a very, very slippery concept. I think it's very difficult to pin down uh, because it is always relational. So I don't have a definition of, of snobbery that I can give you now so you can understand the rest of my talk. You, you just have to listen to the whole thing and see if it makes sense. Um, I think snobbery is relational, for example, in a social hierarchical sense, right? If you look at the snob from a, a higher social class, you see the cobbler, the nouveau riche, if you don't, you see the aristocrat, uh, the true gentleman. Let's take the case of uh, Jose Fernandez, the main character in the Sobremesa, a novel by um, the Colombian writer Jose Asuncion Silva. This is a late 19th century novel. Fernandez, the main character, right, um, whose position in the social world of Bogota is privileged, is also a big lover of philosophy, art, and luxury. In fact, it is easy to find in this character echoes of uh, Wiesmann's The This Is Sun from Oregon, uh, Against the Grain, uh, and all published in 1884. Maybe you have read it. 
But when Fernandez travels to Paris, he discovers that in spite of his money and his cultural capital, which is very, very big, the French regard him, in his own words, as a ridiculous uh, rastaquer. And I'll pronounce all the French words in English now. Um, a grotesque snob. That, those are two expressions he used. Ridiculous, rastaquer, grotesque, snob. And later on in the novel, Fernandez reflects on this, pointing out that, to my elegant European friends, I will never stop being the rastaquer who tries to rub elbows with them by standing on his sacks of gold. And to my compatriots, I will never stop being a show-off who wants to show them to what extent he has managed to enter into the grand Parisian world and the cosmopolitan high life. And I think I'll read quotes in Spanish after reading them in English, just to be fair to the Spanish language, I guess. Para mis elegantes amigos europeos, no dejaré de ser nunca el rastacuer que trata de codearse con ellos empinándose en sus talegos de oro. Y para mis compatriotas, no dejaré de ser un farolón que quería mostrarles hasta dónde ha logrado insinuarse en el gran mundo parisiense y en la high life cosmopolita. The high and low dichotomy has here an additional uh, inflection, which is center and periphery, right? Um, Paris and Bogotá. That is why Fernandez equates snob to rastaquer, a word that began to be used in the last decades of the 19th century to refer to those Latin American travelers who, having made a fortune or a lot of money back at home, tried to rub elbows with the French higher classes. So, uh, rastaquero, many people think that rastaquero comes from the French rastaquer, but then the French rastaquer comes from the previous use of the word rastaquero in, in Latin America. Some people claim that the word originated in the expression arrastar, arrastrar cueros, um, coined by the Venezuelan uh, general Jose Antonio Paez, to describe the practice of uh, dragging cow hides to simulate a strength or a force that one doesn't in reality have. Uh, in any case, in the example of Fernandez, it is clear that the rastacuero is a snob as defined from above, right? Not in the sense of being stuck up, but in the sense of being an upstart, a nouveau riche. But snobbery is also positional or, rela or relational in a different way, one unrelated to um, the high-low binary. There is another dis important distinction, I think, to be made. What we could, would, what we could call, um, according to the late 18th century, I'm, I'm sorry, the late 19th century, uh, the triumphant snob, on the one hand, and what we may call the snob who is questioned, on the other hand. I would like to begin by focusing on the latter, uh, the person who wants to pass as someone uh, he or she is not, the, question, the, the snob who is questioned. The Rastacuero is, of course, an example of this snob who is questioned. Uh, but if we move further back in time, we find several other similar cases. Um, in 1838, for example, the Cuban writer uh, Ramon de Palma publishes in Havana a very cruel satire of uh, the romantic woman, a young romantic woman, entitled uh, La Romantica. In a context, I'm sorry, in the context of uh, the fad of romanticism in Latin America in general and in Cuba in particular, the late 1830s. In this article, De Palma depicts a young woman who, driven by a barbarism of la lettre, starts imitating as well as she can the female heroes of the novel. She imitates their gestures, their tastes, their opinions, their clothing, etc. De Palma clearly doesn't sympathize with this young woman who is represented as uh, eccentric, an object of ridicule, in a similar way in which social types such as the coqueta or the erudito a la violeta, the sham scholar, um, have been satirized in the past. Compared to previous social types, however, um, the Romantica shows a notorious difference, and it is her absolute devotion towards everything new. According to De Palma, the Romantic woman needs what is new and mysterious, and thus her eyes will wander without interest over the entire scene that surrounds her 
until she discovers someone unknown whose posture and attitude offer her something original and capricious. La romántica tiene necesidad de lo nuevo y misterioso, así es que sus ojos vagarán sin interés por todo el concurso que la rodea hasta que descubra algún ser desconocido cuyo porte y actitud ofrezcan algo de original y caprichoso. So she's very bored and is a very modern character, right? Boredom as a specifically modern pathology. Um, in a similar way to the late uh, 19th century Cuban poet Julián del Casal, who transformed the room where he lived in a Japanese residency, the Romantica has an unexplainable inclination for the exotic. The Palma tells us that she prefers the sea, the hills, and the ruins, I was going to say, but I have just remembered that we don't have any. So, in spite of her efforts to look special and in spite of her passion for the new, um, the Romantica is accused of being inauthentic. According to the Palma, her dresses reflect the second to last place in novels. And he immediately clarifies, I am writing the second to last because the Cuban Romantica is not but the reflection of her European sisters. And it is not uncommon that the last things to get here are the second to last and even the third to last over there. So the basic point articulated by the uh, Palma, as you can see, is that Romanticism is a fad imported into Cuba from Europe, right? Romanticism in Havana, in his wars, is a ridiculous simulacrum, the parody of a tragedy that we do not understand. The key word here is simulacrum, that is fiction, a forgery, counterfeit. The simulacrum, I believe, is a central concept for any critique of snobbery, uh, inasmuch as these critiques deny the authenticity of the tastes of the snob. But it, is also, um, it has also been central, the concept of simulacrum, in critiques of romanticism, modernismo, indigenismo, and other literary movements in Latin America, which have been often denounced as simple reflections of European or North American trends. And I will refer again to the, simula so the simulacrum uh, shortly. But let's go back to La Romantica. If if La Romantica occupies one extreme in the arch that goes from inauthentic to authentic, um, as the 19th century continues, her odd behavior and her taste for the exotic start acquiring greater legitimacy. And this is the case with many phenomena, uh, phenomena that I study, like fashion, for example. First of all, you see it in periodicals, for example, as an object of ridicule. It's being denounced little by little people start writing it about it more seriously. And um, it, it acquires legitimacy uh, and it stops being just, uh, um, you know, something ridiculed or denounced. So the behavior of the Romantica is the same thing. Um, let's take the case of the most popular poet of modernismo, right? We're moving to the late uh, 19th century, Rubén Darío. Darío was, of course, criticized for being imitative, uh, but he was also praised by many of his contemporaries and praised in such a way that his imitative nature is rather seen as originality. In 1898, for example, uh, the Guatemalan writer uh, Enrique Gomez Carrillo writes the following, addressing Rubén Darío himself. You are, in effect, the perfect type of snob in the Parisian style. In short, the triumphant snob. Everything new and everything rare finds in you an enthusiastic curiosity and an almost religious respect. You are the near genius incarnation of the spirit that our maestro Valera calls novelero, lover of all things new, right? and which should be called cosmopolitan and dilettante. You want to know it all, see it all, experience it all, and express it all. Your intellect is a cinematograph that is incessantly reflects the thousand faces of universal sensibility, wisdom, and thought. Usted es en efecto el tipo perfecto del snob a la moda de París, del snob victorioso, en fin. Todo lo nuevo y todo lo raro 
encuentra en usted una curiosidad entusiasta y un respeto casi religioso. Usted es la encarnación casi genial del espíritu que nuestro maestro Valera llama novelero y que debiera llamarse cosmopolita y diletante. Quiere usted saberlo todo, verlo todo, conocerlo todo y expresarlo todo. Su intelecto es un cinematógrafo que refleja incesantemente las mil fases de la sensibilidad, de la sabiduría y del pensamiento universales. Rubén Darío, in the Guatemalan writer's words, is a snob in the Parisian style, a triumphant snob. So what does this mean? What do you think it means? Um, I'll tell you. Um, I, mean, I, I taught two classes in the morning, so I constantly stop myself, you know, refrain from talking, and, but, but maybe I shouldn't here, right? I'll, 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 I'll let you ask a lot of questions very soon. Um, I think it means, first of all, that Rubén Darío is not a, it's not a Nicaraguan snob. He's a snob like the ones you may find in, you may find in Paris. It also means, I mean, that's what Gomez Carrillo is saying, right? It also means that Darío is not someone who tries to pass as something that he's not. He's someone who, as a matter of fact, does such a convincing job that he becomes his performance. Or rather, there is no difference between identity and performance here. And once he triumphs, once that uh, the Latin American writer is at the level of Paris and becomes one more of its artists, the pathetic snobbery of the Romantica disappears, replaced by a dignified snobbery, one that consists, according to Gomez Carrillo, in an absolute enthusiasm for the new, something um, that had contributed to, to the ridiculousness of the Romantica, but is now represented under a positive light. So, We should emphasize that Gomez Carrillo characterizes Darío as a snob. There are wannabe snobs, social climbers, posers, and then there are people like Darío who, as triumphant snobs, seem to be beyond the accusation of inauthenticity. And the triumphant snob makes visible what we could call the noble or the dignified dimension of snobbery. Uh, the snob is, in its most common sense, the person who looks down on those regarded as socially inferior, someone who, for example, exhibits her cultural capital in order to demarcate her high standing in the social world or in the market. But a triumphant snob, such as Darío, makes also visible a dimension that is not reducible to this definition, uh, a dimension not marked by social anxiety or any type of instrumentality. In Darío, according to Gómez Carrillo, and if you recall, this was also the case with José Fernández, we find a desire to know it all, see it all, experience it all, and express it all, and to express it all by imitating. In the romantic woman, we could also find this modern desire for something else, and this imitation of the rare and the new. But in her satire, the romantica was clearly a poseur, a pathetic lady of Havana trying to pass as a French one. Rubén Darío is the romantica reincarnated with the big difference that in spite of uh, his posing, his constant imitation of uh, French poets, he's also praised by many as original. So what has, what has happened? I mean, what has happened in the Latin American Republic of Letters over the course of the 19th century for such a thing to be possible? Well, basically I think there begins to be room for the dandy. And I don't want to yeah, make this too long, so let me just say that the dandy is a kind of modern hero who, by posing, achieves authenticity. The dandy is, by definition, one who cannot be censored uh, for being imitative, derivative, or inauthentic, inasmuch as um, he's an anarchist who respects no rules and who is in constant transformation. Let me quickly, uh, quickly remind you of uh, Darío's uh, proclamation, 1896, of his anarchic, anarchic aesthetics. He says, uh, estetica acratica in cosas profanas, right? Uh, anarchism is invoked many times by modernistas uh, precisely because of their affinity with this other figure, which is the, the, the dandy. Um, 
The moment when Rubén Darío can be celebrated as original in spite of his obvious imitations, the moment when his imitations are no, no longer perceived as pathetic attempts to pass as something he is not, to pass as a French poet, for example. This is the moment when the figure of the dandy becomes a viable metaphor with which to consider the relationship to Europe, displacing those of the Rastacuero and the Romantica. Even though the danger of being perceived as a Rastacuero or worse, a romantic woman are still there, the Latin American artist has now also the possibility of identifying as a dandy, a victorious snob. I mentioned earlier that the two debates I'm interested in are the debate on cultural importation, and debate of democratization, and this is clearly, clearly related to the first one, right? Cultural importation, how do Latin Americans um, relate to um, central nations, European nations, North American uh, writers, etc., etc. But of course, Rubén Darío and Modernismo in general are part of a very late chapter in uh, the long tale of Latin American identity or cultural identity. If I had spent quite a few minutes referring to this period, it is because with Modernismo, Snobbery reveals in full its affinity with the realm of the aesthetics. Snobbery, I would like to suggest, always had to do with posing, with passing, with a social game of appearances, with a complex economy of science. I don't have time here to uh, fully develop my hypothesis, but let me at least share with you. Uh, the more it approaches to the aesthetic, the more legitimate <coughs> snobbery becomes. The snobs who triumph are therefore the dandy, who by constant uh, public performance becomes a beacon for the fashionable world, or rather Started, so we have enough time for questions. Um, thank you so much for coming. There's lots of new faces here today, which is always wonderful. Um, my name is Sarah Rip. I'm the outreach coordinator and uh, undergrad advisor for the Latin American Caribbean and Iberian Studies program. And um, glad you made it out on this chilly, uh, first sort of fallish day that we have um, this fall. And as you can see, there's some hot tea and coffee and snacks in the back. So um, help yourself and. If you have an opportunity, there is um, a clipboard back there in the corner. If you want to sign up for our listserv, um, we send out a weekly event calendar every Thursday, so you can be added to that. And I'll turn it over to Alberto Vargas, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, well, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, this semester, we're having a series uh, of invited guests that are new. I will speak about both terms, the Gandhi. I don't know how to pronounce the, okay. the other one either, the Arasta <laughs> Uh But um, I will also, uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, bring up a new dimension that wasn't here when I provided you with the title. So basically, um, what I want to share with you today is a project that has roots in earlier research um, on the emergence of, of uh, fashion in early 19th century Latin America. Fashion understood as a social mechanism. But now, um, um, this project is more related to my current interest in passing, um, in the problem of passing, racial passing, for example. Um, I am analyzing uh, the discourse of inauthenticity that was leveled um, against certain kinds of social performance. Um, so let's talk about snobbery. Uh, this is a topic uh, you're all familiar with. Some people claim that we're all snobs up to a certain degree. For some of us, the snob is just a rare uh, specimen. But, uh, but we all seem to have an idea of what a snob is. Um, snobbish is nowadays usually understood as a synonym of uh, conceited, um, stuck up, right? And it's used to describe people who think they are better than they are better than than you, right? Or better than us. However, in its origins, um, the word snob meant precisely the opposite. Um, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, in the late eighteenth century, snob meant cobbler, and then came to refer to any ordinary person lacking high rank or status. And then, by the um, faculty on campus. So we're very happy that today uh, Victor Colger Carvalho uh, 
accepted to come and give, give this, this talk. Um, Professor Gautier Carvalho got his PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. And he's here in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. He specializes in 18th and 19th century Latin American literature. His first book uh, was called La Experiencia de lo Nuevo. And he's going to talk about uh, Dandies and Rastaquah, a history of snobbery in Latin America. Looking forward to see the meaning of that word. So welcome. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to Lassis for the invitation. And thanks to you for being here. Um, yes, I uh, was this in 18th and 19th century Latin America, uh, including that of the feminine man, the hombre mujer, uh, the snobbery of the pedantic man, the pedante, and the vanity of the, the fop, the petimetre. So linking the critiques uh, directed at these social types to those addressed towards uh, blacks and mulattoes, um, I think might bring uh, to light uh, a broader construction of acceptable and unacceptable forms of mimesis. And while there is a large body of scholarship on um, passing in US studies, um, this is a relatively unexplored terrain in Latin American studies. And, uh, and one that has also, I think, compelling connections to, um, not only to race, but also to questions of gender and, and class. Uh, so I'll talk about passing more towards the end of the talk. 